So, good afternoon, everyone here in the room, and good day for everyone who is online following this workshop. So, welcome to this uh, workshop on the uh, support, consultancy, and services for the implementation and practical use of the set of energy performance of building standards. And this workshop is organized by the EPB Center in collaboration with Riva. Um, my name is uh, Dick van Dijk, and I'm stepping in for Jaap Hoveling, who unfortunately yesterday evening tested positive on COVID-19. So he went home to go in isolation, of course. Um, my background is that uh, I started my career in the energy performance of buildings uh, standardization in the 1990s, early 1990s, with a uh, request of, from the Dutch government to develop a national standard to assess the overall energy performance of buildings. By that time, it was a very novel idea. And uh, since then, I've been involved with the subject and being, respon being responsible for the Dutch method. In the first instance, and later on, um, a number of experts from uh, several European countries, they joined forces and tried to come to harmonized methods, uh, which uh, took a long way, but in uh, uh, 2017, uh, the current generation of set of e EPB standards was published thanks to a mandate from the European Commission. And uh, it was not only uh, covering the uh, European area, but also had some global impact because about uh, one third of the standards in volume, but in importance, I guess about two thirds of the uh, standards were published also in ISO, so relevant at the global level. Um, so this, because it was linked to the EPBD, the uh, main purpose of the standards was and is to assess the energy performance in the context of building regulations, so to check compliance with the minimum energy performance requirements, and to assess uh, the energy label and to give information for the energy performance certificate. Well, as I said, the standards were published 2017, so you would say work done, but actually um, the, the work had to start from that moment on, uh, the next level, uh, that was the implementation in the countries, and to avoid that the expertise would uh, get scattered or worse, uh, even lost, and to support the rollout and the implementation of the set of standards, uh, Jaap Hoogling and I initiated the uh, EPB Center to uh, keep the uh, expertise um, and, uh, and also to, uh, to um, enable to uh, share the, all the background information and new information to the, to the public to uh, support uh, the, for the, in the implementation of these standards. So, um, yeah, and then, so this the EPB Center, which was um, formally founded by the Dutch Knowledge Center for Building and Systems, the ISO, and uh, RIVA. And in the recent years, it was uh, supported by the European Commission um, with a service contract. Well, today we will discuss the added value of these standards and what is needed to unleash the full potential of uh, the standards. And we'll also learn about developments uh, in this area in China and the USA. So I especially welcome the um, speakers of today, which is um, Mr. Pau Garcia Audi, uh, who uh, from the European Commission, who you already met this morning uh, in the as a keynote speaker. And uh, the second speaker is Yan Ling uh, Wu from China. Unfortunately, he could not be present uh, here um, physically, uh, but he prepared a, his presentation in video, so we'll have a video presentation from him, and he is from the Chinese HVAC organization. And then the third speaker is 
Mr. Mick uh, Schwedler from Ashray, and I propose that he gives a longer introduction of himself <laughs> uh, when he uh, gives his uh, speech. And uh, then the last speaker is uh, myself. And then in, uh, this will be uh, followed by uh, an uh, open discussion. So the agenda, so I introduce the speakers and then uh, this was the welcome and introduction. So the, so, uh, so the next one uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Garcia Audi will be on the EPB standards and EPB revision in Europe. And uh, uh, I missed one. <laughs> so the, okay, so Mick Svetler will be on uh, the energy uh, performance standards and the building performance policy in the US and Yanling Wu on EPB standards and building performance policy in China. And I will be uh, focusing on the EPB center resources, consultancy and services, and then we'll have the open discussion. So um, the first speaker is uh, Pau, so I ask Pau uh, to start the first presentation. Thank you also for getting my surname right. Uh, a lot of people don't. <laughs> so very much, very much appreciated. It's, it's an easy surname to confuse because of the car company. Right, so well, thank you very much uh, to the EPB Center for inviting me to be here today and, and also to, to Oliva. We've worked a lot uh, with the SEN standards and with the EPB Center in, in particular to support the um, the uh, use of the standards as much as possible in the EU. So it's, uh, it's very nice to be here today. Um, so they, they asked me to give a, a, a broad introduction to how we use the EPB standards in the, um, or how we have used them in the past, or why do we have EPB standards in, um, in, the, in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, so I went a little bit on the past. Um, in 2008, uh, 2002, sorry, we had the first EPBD. Um, it had uh, one requirement, which was, well, it had multiple requirements, but there was one particular relevant to this discussion today, which was um, the member states had to adopt a, me a methodology for the calculation of the energy performance of buildings. Before that, in many member states, that was not a requirement. It did not exist. There were some requirements, for example, at the level of you need to ensure you value of so and so, you need to ensure an efficiency of a boiler or certain conditions for the boiler, but that was the first time that at EU level we had something that said you need to look at the energy performance of a building. And that is the calculation methodology. As a piece of legislation, it's very good. It's very simple. It has one, two, three verbs, two shall and one should. Perfect. Uh, very easy to transpose, um, but very quickly we, um, we started realizing that um, we needed to converge and make something that, it w that was a bit more, um, more coherent. Nevertheless, this was a very good starting point. So in 2010, when we did the recast of the EPBD, uh, we updated the uh, general framework, so we updated this description, um, we introduced uh, the, re the reference to typical conditions, so it wasn't just about design conditions. We, we referred to the fact that you had to account for typical conditions, and we also introduced a requirement to have these, in, uh, these calculations in primary energy. That's a very important concept for us because of a number of reasons that I will explain afterwards. But also very important, in 2010, we launched the, uh, the mandate for the EPB standards. So, as I mentioned, this is as a legislative text is very good, as a piece of calculation methodology, not so much. It, it needs formulas, it needs options, it needs meat to really start the, um, the assessment. So that's why we had the, uh, the EPB standards in, in 2010. That's when we launched them, sorry. So in 2018, we amended the EPBD again. Uh, we introduced a common indicator. Until then, we had a common indicator that was primary energy, but it wasn't specified in terms of units. We then said, okay, no, the primary indicator is kilowatt hours per square meter per year of primary, um, of primary energy. And then we also introduced a reference to standards and obligations to report. Um, one of the issues that we have um, with the EPBD 
one of the challenges that we have with EPDD is that it, it's a directive. It means that member states need to adapt this EU legislation to a national legislation. It's not a regulation that it says, this is how you do it, full stop. This is the methodology you have to apply, that's it, nothing to do about it. It is a directive which member states need flexibility to adapt. And, and they are very, very um, clear on the fact that they want this flexibility because they have to respond to multiple national situations. So what we did instead is, now that we have a set of EPD standards, because by then we pretty much had them, um, we introduced references and we said, okay, when you communicate to the Commission your um, transposition measures, your, your calculation methodology, you have to use the EPB standards in order to communicate with us. You have to describe your national calculation methodology according to the EPB standards. You don't have to use the EPB standards in your every day-to-day -day business, but when you talk to us, you have to do it. And that has really allowed us to start understanding what are the differences between the, um, between the member states at, at legal level. Um, in 2021, so just a, a few months ago, um, we proposed uh, another revision of the EPDD and uh, we introduced an, a number of measures to uh, adapt the, uh, the methodology, particularly uh, we require hourly calculations um, because um, we think that it's very relevant at this moment where we are really approaching the, um, the internal gains with the, uh, with the heat demand, where we are starting to really measure, um, sorry, when, when the influence of PV is, is becoming more and more um, important, and when we're starting to introduce a number of charging points in buildings which can have a significant impact on the energy consumption of the building and on the bill that the person gets at the end of the month, we thought that we really need our calculations in order to make this, um, this clear. Um, we also introduced some requirements for the use of measured energy when calculating the energy performance of a building because measured energy is very subject to the building user, so um, there can be significant differences there, so we need some way of harmonizing it. And then um, other elements that we introduced, for example, uh, stronger links to, to product regulations, so it's all the energy labeling and the eco-design uh, legislation. Um, for us, also very important, um, because we rely a lot on the primary energy factor to differentiate the use between different fuels. Um, we want to recognize when um, there is a benefit on the primary energy factor. For example, if you're using uh, district heating, then that should be recognized in the, um, in the calculation. So we make that requirement um, very clear, and in addition, um, we introduce addition, the option to have additional indicators such as CO2 emissions. So, um, and now you will have to bear with me because I realized today I made a mistake on the slides, so I will have to go back and forth a couple of times. So please bear with me, there is a method to my madness. So um, the calculation methodology, first of all, it has to be flexible, uh, not just because we have multiple building typologies, but also because we have the same building typology applied to a variety of climates, a variety of building traditions, and a variety of climates. We very much focus on asset calculation, meaning for us, for the, um, for the EPBD, what is very relevant is when we compare buildings to one another or when we design a building, the minimum energy performance requirements are the same for every building. Regardless, and I say this carefully, regardless of what the user is doing on, at the moment. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, um, the calculation must reflect the typical operation, but it also um, needs to be, remember, it needs to be flexible. Um, we rely very much on the primary energy use, and for that we need the primary energy factors. Um, for us, it's very important to reflect the fact that it, there is a very significant difference what is the energy carrier and where that energy comes from. And there are very significant differences across the member states. So you have some member states that rely very heavily, for example, on renewable energy, which means that they have uh, a primary energy that it's 1.5, 1.6, so relatively low, while we have other member states, for example, that still rely heavily on coal and they have a primary energy factor of above four. So it's very, very different. We still need the primary energy factor. Maybe one day when we have much closer primary energy factors, we can discuss it again, but for now, that is still very, very relevant for us. 
And then um, we also have um, additional indicators which are, which are possible. For example, kilograms of CO2, that is becoming a very, very important indicator right now. We can use um, the calculation methodology either calculated or measured. And I put an asterisk there because there are conditions on how you have to calculate. You need to, in order to be able to use measured energy uh, from a building for the calculation of the energy performance, you need to be able to extract the user behavior and to extract the, um, the, uh, the effects of climate, local climate, or because that year you had a very good year. So I'm gonna skip this bottom bit for a moment. So um, calculation methodology in practice. Um, as I mentioned, there is a requirement to have a lot of flexibility between member states, which means that there are significant differences in its application. Not so much on the formulas. The, the formulas, it's physics, it doesn't change very much. Um, but there are differences in the way they apply the primary energy factors. There are also differences in which they apply um, for example, where are the boundaries exactly in, in a building? And then one of my favorite, um, which really shows the one of the challenges that we have in the EU, is there are multiple ways of calculating what is the area of a building. You would think that that's easy. It isn't. Um, I mentioned before, we mainly use it as an asset uh, tool. We mainly use it as a, to compare buildings. That's true. We use it mainly for compliance, but um, the calculation methodology is a very powerful tool when it comes to design and certification of buildings. I worked in the industry when the EPCs were introduced back in 2006, I mean, when they were transposed, and it made a hell of a lot of a difference to how we used to work. Um, for the first time, we could speak with architects, we could speak with, I'm a mechanical engineer, we could speak with electric engineers, and we could sit, ra sit around the table and decide how was best to, um, to design a building. It really made a significant, I think, it made a significant impact on how we did things on site. Um, and then the calculation methodology is uh, used in different ways. There are member states that have developed their own tool and all designers have to use, all practitioners, they have to use the same tool. Uh, there are other member states uh, that they license the tool and then there are other member states that have a mixed approach. So it really depends on the, um, on the member states. Um, so the, here we come to the, um, to the EPB standards. Um, when we produce the, uh, the mandate for this, again, flexibility of adoption uh, is, a, is an important element for us. Member states can adopt the standards, we cannot force them to adopt them. Uh, they retain the, uh, the option to say we want to use them standards or not. Um, they can also apply this to the modular approach. They don't necessarily need to adapt all the standards, they can pick and choose what they want to, what they want to use, which for us it's good because it gives them the flexibility that they ask for. And then, um, I mentioned before, they now have an obligation to report using the, um, the standards. That's very useful for us. We are now getting a good understanding of what are the actual differences between member states. It's taking us a while, but um, we're getting there. Um, for that, um, we use, of, of course, the overarching standards. We also use the indoor requirements, and then, of course, the, uh, the primary energy factors, because these are very, very relevant to us. Why do we need all this calculation methodology? Well, the, um, the, uh, this links to a significant number of articles and very heavy articles in the EPBD. So for example, it links to the minimum energy performance requirements. So when a building has to be constructed or, or refurbished, they need to comply with this. They demonstrate it through the calculation methodology. It also applies to the, to the cost optimal methodology, which is another type of calculation methodology that is the one that actually defines the minimum energy performance requirement. So that ensures that when they calculate this minimum energy performance requirement, when member states calculate this minimum energy performance requirements to be applied across the building stock, they have to use this cost optimal methodology to make sure that the measures or the levels that they apply are not too heavy, but not too lenient either. It looks for a happy medium. For that, they use the calculation methodology in, in Annex 1. Of course, we use it for uh, energy performance certificates, and we also use it um, because it's linked to financial incentives. So the energy performance of a building is very much linked to financial incentives. And, sorry, it's not moving now. So 
sorry, just one second. There we go. So on the um, revision of the EPVD, um, which is the one we have, uh, we are discussing right now. Again, it links to a significant number of articles. It links very much to minimum energy performance standards because this depends on EPCs, and EPCs depends on the calculation methodology. And bear in mind, that may carry a direct obligation to renovate your building, so it has a very significant weight. Of course, it, re it uh, refers to energy performance certificates, it refers to renovation passports, um, it's very important for the zero emission building calculation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The calculation methodology is pretty much everywhere. So um, that's one of the reasons why, um, when we um, in 2018, when we did the latest revision of the EPVD that is now in, in force, we launched a project to support member states in the role of making this translation between the national me calculation methodology and speaking to us using the language of the EPV standard. So we launch um, together with uh, with Senate, the EPV Center. We launch a support service to help member states, but also pretty much anybody in the industry that wanted to use the EPV standards. Um, I have to say, uh, because I was in charge of the project from the Commission side, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, it was very easy to work with them, super proactive. It was almost a hands-off project, which is very nice for us, uh, because they are very interested in doing this job. So um, for us, it was, uh, it was very good. So I hope this serves as an introduction to why we have the EPV standards and how we try to apply them in, in the EU. Bear in mind, it's 28, sorry, 27 member states, um, but actually it's a bit more complicated than that um, because we have uh, Belgium, for example, is three regions, Germany, they have a number of landers as well, Italy has 40-something different provinces, Spain has uh, 17, 17 regions and two cities uh, that may also have differences at national, regional, and even local levels sometimes. So it's a complicated piece of work. Thank you very much. So the next presentation will be by uh, Mick Svetlana. Thank you very much, Dick. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, a self-introduction, I, I began to get interested in energy in the 1970s. And I got an engineering degree and then went on to, to get a master's degree and did research in solar energy. Um, that was a time when we had tax incentives for, for solar energy. They went away and the solar business went from here to zero. Um, I then started working with the company I work with now and I was uh, writing energy modeling software. And now, now I'm in a group that helps people design and optimize systems. I have the privilege to be ASHRAE president this year. And as uh, I'll, I'll point out a couple times, I've served a lot with respect to energy usage within the buildings and energy standards. Uh, I was struck by how similar the EU is to the United States. You would think if we have one country, it would be simple, but, but we don't make it simple. Uh, the way our laws are put together is the federal government can pass a law requiring every state to update an energy standard, but the states can ignore it. They can do what they want. But it's even not th that easy because each state is going to do what it wants, but there's some states called home rule states where the cities, the states can't mandate what the cities do, but the cities get to decide. Uh, they change the codes, they change the standards for their local conditions, for what they want to accomplish, and really the, the, it's the local enforcement that really uh, helps move and reduce the energy usage. So, so that's, that, that's where it happens. ASHRAE Standard 90 started in 1975 in response to the energy crisis. And uh, you'll, you see the graph there. I, I was involved in the 90.1 committee for the 1999 version, and then I was chair of the committee for the 2010 version. Uh, our 44 engineers or people involved on that standard reduced the energy usage by 30% from what it had been before. And you'll see that since 1975, we've gotten down to reduce the energy usage of the buildings by about 56%. So 
So there's significant progress. We're not where we want to be, but we want to make sure that uh, people that we celebrate the successes that, it, that have occurred already. And as we've seen the last few years, it, a lot of the conversations have gone from energy usage to environmental emissions, mainly as uh, measured using uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, another thing to point out is that while the, the standards are from ASHRAE and the, the A originally stood for American, uh, we are a global society and some of the standards are adopted uh, throughout the world. So th this isn't just about the US, but I'm trying to give you s some background with respect to the standards. So ASHRAE has all of these different standards that deal with energy. I'm just gonna highlight a couple. The first two, 90.1 and 90.2, are commercial and residential energy standards, primarily for new buildings, uh, renovations, alterations, and additions. Then we have standard 100, which is for existing buildings. And that is uh, strictly, here is the energy usage in terms of, for us, kilowatt hours per square foot per year. We have high performance buildings all the way through. I'll talk about some of them. We have some safety standards with respect to safe use of refrigerants. Today with the new refrigerants that are, are flammable or slightly flammable or whatever we want to call them, how do we handle them and keep people safe in the buildings? And then I'll also talk about some advanced energy design guides, which really are uh, a partnership with the industry to get us closer and down to zero or net zero. Within standard 90.1, our goal is moving toward zero energy within the buildings. Um, and you, you saw the trajectory. We're, we're, going, we're going to continue on that trajectory. And it's a whole building plus the building site energy use. So it actually goes outside the building to outdoor lighting and things like that. Uh, there's some new things, however. And that is we want to make sure we give uh, flexibility to the way people are doing business today. And we're, we allow them to do energy credits. They're, in the past, it was more based on pieces of equipment and then put into uh, systems. Now we're giving uh, system HVAC system designers a lot more flexibility from the HVAC system and lighting system to uh, just monitor if, for example, if, if that's the only system that's being changed, they can do a systems ratio. <clears throat> we also uh, have included uh, carbon and how we're going to do that from a carbon impact and we're addressing renewables within 90.1 and 90.2, which are the minimum energy requirements. As I said, uh, standard 100 is our existing building standard and you can read the slide, so I, I, I'm not going to read the words to you, but basically it sets those levels. Here is for your particular climate zone, and that could be a different country, a different state, a different city, for your particular building type, and here is the energy usage that that building should have from a, a standpoint. We've also worked with uh, different entities to uh, specialize that, for the local conditions. The state of Washington is right on the Pacific Ocean and their climate is different on the west side of the state on the ocean and on the east side of the state, which is desert. So we coordinated with them with this existing building standard and helped them get a standard that they have now adopted for their local standard. And as, as you can see, how do you you talked a little bit, Paul, about the, about the area. And I, I smiled because there are quite a few ways to measure building area depending who you're talking to. So we also want to make sure that we have a common, a common language for what is the basis for re reporting the building energy usage. Uh, challenges to, to decarbonize our building stock. In, a, in the developed countries like Western Europe, like Europe, like the United States, Canada, probably 70 to 80 percent of the buildings that will be around in 2050 are, have already been built. If we don't start to have an impact on our existing infrastructure, we cannot have a significant impact from a building standpoint 
on reducing the energy usage and reducing the environmental emissions. So it's extremely important for us to be addressing and working with people to ensure that those existing buildings become more efficient, add renewables where they can, and then that they can, they can report their energy usage moving forward and obviously reduce that energy usage and reduce the emissions. Um, about five years ago, uh, ASHRAE has its global headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. In the area where it was, there's Children's Hospital of Atlanta had started to buy up all the land around our headquarters. And we realized that our headquarters and our staff we're going to be in a construction zone for about 25 years. Um, I love chilled water plants on large campuses. They were going to put their chilled water plant cooling towers right next to our staff parking lot. So it, it wasn't going to be ideal. Uh, we were the second to last property to sell. The last property actually hasn't sold. It's a guitar shop. The person must love their guitar shop because uh, they're, they're still there. But once we, we decided to sell our headquarters, we had a decision to make. Do we lease a building? Because from a business standpoint, um, that might be a lower cost for us. But when you lease a building, you lose the control of how that building is uh, run, how it's operated, and what you can do with that building. Uh, do we build a new building? and we, we examine some sites that were being developed, or do we take a 1970s vintage building, totally renovate it, retrofit it to be near zero energy, and add photovoltaic panels on the roof and on the ground? Well, we pushed the button that was not the easy button, and we used the, the, the high efficiency, low energy systems, we looked at things from a, an overall standpoint. But what we wanted to do is not, not just move forward, but to set an example. We can take vintage buildings. We can make them low energy. And if we have the area, we can make them net zero. We, are, we were net zero in April 2022 for the first time after finally getting our photovoltaics online. So we wanted to make sure we were being an example for the industry and we're sharing that information uh, all over so that people can understand this is possible, it is doable, and it can be economical. Uh, with respect to decarbonization, uh, there are a lot of building performance standards. There, there have been probably, uh, about a year ago, it was 29 different locations that had set particular uh, carbon emissions standards carbon emissions requirements. Uh, they did it in different ways. Some, uh, some locations uh, will be charging fees. They didn't call them taxes. They'll be charging fees if you're above a certain carbon emission level. And it's, it starts at a fairly low fee in 2024, but it goes up very, very quickly in by 2030. So, so the goal of those areas is to reduce carbon emissions. I will say I, in my day job, I have a little bit of um, angst about the designs I'm seeing and whether or not they can actually be operated. Because it's the building operators that will determine whether or not we actually reduce the energy emissions and reduce the carbon emissions. But from a building performance standards uh, standpoint, we want to take care of those existing buildings. We're measuring the data, we meter the data, and that allows us to increase the stringency as we move forward. From a national standpoint, the, the present administration has gotten together with a coalition that by 2024 is going to uh, take care of the, the reductions there, 22% uh, of the population, by um, Earth Day, which is May in, uh, April or May in 2024. And the, these people are committed to moving forward, so the, the, the on-the-ground um, legislation, the on-the-ground encouragement is going to continue to rapidly increase. Uh, we are working with and collaborating with 
everybody. Uh, we, we've had a chance to meet, ASHRAE leadership has had a chance to meet with your REVA leadership at our January conference in Las Vegas. We just finished a meeting with your leadership here, and we're working and trying to figure out how do we collaborate more and more as we move forward. Because we've discovered uh, the last two and a half years, we have one globe. From a healthcare standpoint, from a, a transportation standpoint, and certainly from a climate standpoint. So when we have one globe, we, meet, we need to make sure we're taking the best ideas from everywhere and making sure that they're used to reduce the emissions. Uh, last year, uh, President Chuck Gulledge and I put into place uh, a task force on build, for building decarbonization. And that task force is moving forward. It's becoming more strategic, getting information out that our practitioners need the design community, the construction community, in order to actually reduce the carbon emissions. Because there are a lot of commitments being made, but commitments don't reduce carbon. It's the people in this room that reduce the carbon, you working with the building owners and the building operators. So we want to make, we're making sure that people have the correct tools. In addition, the ASHRAE Board of Directors in our January meeting uh, in, in, 1970, in 1973, the Board of Directors put an urgency with respect to the energy crisis then. We're putting toward that, forward that same urgency with respect to reducing carbon emissions. And in fact, we allocated $550,000 to expedite our decarbonization process, getting the information out to people. Another body that we work closely with also set aside $550,000 to expedite their processes because we need to move forward more quickly. We need to make sure people have the tools and we need to make sure that we're actually having a global impact. Uh, one of the things that uh, presidential member Don Colliver put together were advanced energy design guides. And they, these are not ASHRAE publications. These are publications from four different organizations. And the, the most recent ones are zero energy usage. The, the, the one that just came online a year, a, a month ago, is for multifamily buildings, which is the largest building construction in the world. There are all kinds of buildings being constructed for multifamily. They're available for free download. So you can go to that site. We're going to have a, a, a decarbonization uh, position document, which is our official position, position coming out. We're doing all the things we talked about, and my time is up. So we'll take questions afterward. Correct, Dick? So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mikko, a very interesting uh, presentation on the situation in the uh, United States. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm looking for the slide to announce uh, the presentation by video of Mr. Yan Yin Wu. Um, but I guess that it can be started from the back of the room. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is Jian Ling Wu from China Academy of Building Research. On Klima 2022, I'm representing China Alliance of Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning, or SCA HVAC. It's my great pleasure and honor to be invited to this session to update you on EPB standards and the building performance policy in China. First, I would like to talk about development of China's building energy efficiency, followed by ongoing key activities and wrapping up with a few remarks for future trends. China started its building energy efficiency work 
back in 1980s. China is a large country with five major climate zones. Back to 30 years ago, with limited resource, priorities had to be taken for building energy efficiency work. It was decided to start from the cold region, dominated with heating demand, before moving into warmer climate zones. Focusing on residential buildings, then go to public building. Focus on new construction, then renovation. It also implies focus on design, then operation. So up to now, building energy efficiency standards uh, is covering all five climate zones and all construction stages. China has made substantial progress. We typically use this chart to demonstrate the steps taken. Taking the residential building code for northern China as an example, which is the dark blue lines in this slide, it underwent three 30% improvements in 1986, 1995, and 2010, as you can see the three steps. It's finally reaching a 65% energy saving rate compared to the baseline. The same is happening with public building, with a 50% improvement in 2005, and another 30% improvement in 2015. From research side, various projects have been implemented, especially on the international collaboration side. I have listed a few of them. Uh, as you can see, the top one, the, the purple one, is the one under IEA framework is for application of renewable energy storage technology for low energy buildings. And the middle, the green and the yellow, are under the China-US Clean Energy Research Center program. It started the nearly zero energy building and the net zero energy building. And the, the green one are the Mohard uh, with uh, collaboration with Germany. It's uh, to study and the demonstration of passive ultra-low energy uh, building for different climate zones of China. Also, we have uh, our own national research program, which is the one in red. Uh, I'll talk the, in details in the next slide. The project is called Nearly Zero Energy Building, Key Strategies and Technologies Development. It's a four-year program which has been just finished. The objectives are to propose a technical pathways for NZAPs in different climate zones, and also want to change from the constraint paths into constraint effects, meaning we don't tell you what to do, we we'll, we'll tell you what to achieve. Also, it aims at improve the performance of building components and promoting the upgrading of associated industries. So this research program consists of uh, 10 topics spanning from fundamental research to product development and the design, construction, and the testing stages, and also demonstration and piloting. One of the key outputs is a national standard called technical standard for nearly zero energy buildings, as you can see from the picture to the left. It is in effect starting from 2019. So this standards connects to the existing standards and also uh, aiming at the future. It's uh, in accordance with uh, international voices, but also considering the domestic requirements, such as how to set the technical criteria and uh, recommended uh, technical measures in China. So the, the standards defines three levels of uh, nearly zero, zero energy buildings, as you can see the pyramid. 
and the percentage meaning the energy conservation rate compared to the code of 2015 which is the current code okay so the bottom one is the ultra low energy building which is called the ULAB so which is basically the economically achievable building energy efficiency level on the best uh, um, possible uh, without any contribution from renewable energy and the second uh, level is uh, nearly zero energy building or called the NZAP so it's a further improvement um, uh, from ULAP and but with a 10% mandatory, mandatory renewable energy utilization um, it's corresponding to a 60% to 70% reduction to the current um, code and then we have the, the top level which is a zero energy building it's on the, the NZAP basis but the generated energy has to be low, no less than the consumed energy the standard is performance based the first one in China so it sets up the, the critical index or indicators for IEQ and the EOI for different climate zones and different building type it also provides a design method how to design around the specific energy target it provides tech recommended uh, technical measures if you don't know how to start and finally it also requires a uniform software evaluation to regulate the process um, from possible human intervention and this serves as a caliber to evaluate um, energy performance for building from policy perspective Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development or MOHERT had made a clear plan of uh, building energy efficiency developments in its 13th five-year plan it uh, asks to promote um, ultra low and nearly zero energy building in an active pace and to complete 10 million square meter construction by end of 2020 local governments also provides incentive and supporting policies for example Beijing provides subsidy of uh, renminbi 600 to 1000 per square meter for recognized pilot projects it's around 100 euro per square meter similarly other provinces also put out uh, incentive and uh, supporting policies The first two pilot pro projects are same buildings of uh, Shanghai 2010 Expo, the UK Zero Carbon Museum, and the Germany Hamburg House. In 2013, we built our first NZAP office in CABR, and in 2016, we have the Sino Germany uh, Qingdao um, office um, completed. Since then, hundreds of uh, NZAP projects have, have been built <coughs> in all major climate zones, including a few mega sized commu communities. Talking about the future trend, China's dual carbon goal has to be mentioned. On 2020, September 22nd, President Xi made the remarks at the general debate of the 75th uh, fifth uh, session of the UN General, general Assembly that China will scale up its intended nationally determined contributions to reach carbon peaking by 2030 and striving to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. This sets the main tone of China's development um, of recent year. Carbon emission of China 
is about 10 billion ton in 2018. In building sector, operational emission is about 2.1 billion ton, and there's another 1.8 billion ton from building material and construction process. Compared to developed country, China's operational carbon emission is relatively low. However, because China is still developing, and the carbon emission is still to peak, and so to find a, a clear pathway or roadmap um, on how to achieve the dual carbon goal is very critical. In a recent study on roadmap towards carbon neutrality in building sectors of China, people have um, listed a contribution from various factors, such as new building can contribute 30 to 35 percent, um, then the existing building of 5 to 10 percent, rural area building 5 to 10 percent, and another 10 to 15 percent for renewable energy building utilization. So if we have all done that, there's another 40 to 50 percent left for the energy reform. We will then have to increase the electrification rates of the building. And then also the green the grid has to perform its clean energy upgrades. So only by doing that we can achieve the carbon neutrality goal by 2060. To support the dual carbon work in um, building sector, an important national standard is under compilation. It's called the Technical Standards of Zero Carbon Building. So the kickoff meeting is about one year ago in April 2021. It's indicating that China is transforming from building energy management toward uh, building carbon management. So in the standards, there will be two zero carbon building. One is operational, one is the total. So operational zero carbon building will be aiming at improving the building energy efficiency mainly. But the total zero energy building, meaning you have to consider the lifespan of the building and the embedded carbon emission has to be included. So this is the most influential standards in building sector in China for now. I'd like to finish my presentation by referring back to the code development chart. But this time we are looking at the future. China central government already puts out requirements for massive construction of low carbon and nearly zero energy building in the near future. This will make NZAP or zero carbon building semi compulsive in certain regions. It is actually happening right now. A much faster code development is anticipated for building energy efficiency and carbon emission. We'll see about that. Thank you for your attention. So from here in Rotterdam, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Yang Ling uh, Wu for his presentation. Um, and uh, we continue with the next speaker, which happens to be myself, if I get it working. Oh. I don't want to spend too much time to the presentation, but starting in it, it, one of the last slides is uh, too quick. Uh, so I already introduced myself. So my presentation will be on the EPB Center Supporting Resources, Consultancy and Services. Um, but uh, of course this uh, requires some introduction uh, on the set of EPB st standards where the EPB Center is all about. 
So I'll uh, give some additional information on uh, the technical issues of the standards, uh, additional to uh, what uh, Paul already presented uh, earlier during this workshop. So um, it actually, the, the set of EPB standards comprises a large number of documents. You see here a scheme with uh, only a part of it, actually. And um, one, the, one of the common features is, as you heard before, they're all fit for building regulations for the NZ performance requirements and NZ performance certificates. Um, so here you see a slightly bigger picture. Uh, but the good news is that um, you don't need all these uh, 61 uh, documents to uh, perform an NZ performance calculation. Um, I will not, not go into the details, but there are several other types of uh, standards, uh, like on ins inspection of systems and so on. Uh, as Paul already mentioned, uh, the standards follow a modular approach. So here you see the main modules uh, organized to the expertise or services. And um, each of these modules also has some sub-modules, uh, which uh, uh, enables the countries to have a step-by-step -step implementation of the standards, so make it easier to, uh, to implement the standards. It's also easier for the development and the maintenance of the standards, rather than having everything in one document where you have to uh, get all the expertises together and then you f end up with uh, splitting it up in chapters and making people responsible for s different chapters and you have the same thing but less transparent than having these standards in a modular way. Um, if you look at the key EPB standards, that's always a tricky thing because uh, what, what are the key standards? But uh, um, you need to do. You need to make a selection to uh, to to, f to find your way in the uh, in all the documents. And uh, this was a f an, an attempt to uh, identify the, the key standards. So th on top you have uh, the what we call the overarching standard, the 52,000 uh, Part One, uh, which uh, gives you the uh, primary energy and um, and other. Uh, uh, indicators like uh, CO2 and costs uh, collected from um, the energy used and energy produced by the different um, uh, technical building services. And uh, so you need uh, the information from uh, from the technical building services, and we picked a number of standards from from those. So on airflow calculation, which is very important, the ventilation system and then a uh, framework standard on the systems. And we also picked the heat pump system standard, and not because Hank Kranenberg is in the room, but because this is a, f is a very uh, uh, um, uh, important uh, technology, which is all at the same time uh, very complex, because you have different, very different types, very uh, not so straight, straightforward, uh, link to the product uh, uh, information, and it's also uh, uh, interlaced with the calculation of the energy needs and the indoor temperatures in the building. Um, having mentioned that, so when you calculate the energy uh, you needed for the systems, you need to know what are the energy needs. So we picked the standard on energy needs for heating and cooling as also one of the key standards um, because it's not only the standard to calculate the energy needs, but it also calculates the indoor temperature in the building, uh, so it is directly related to the thermal comfort in, in the building as well. And um, you can imagine, that's what you see at the left side, that the, oh, sorry, <laughs> wrong button, that the left side, that there is an interaction between the energy use, energy need, uh, with respect to uh, thermal comfort and uh, also the performance of the systems which depend on the energy needs and the temperatures. So then you have uh, at the bottom boundary conditions and the most important ones are the climatic conditions, outdoor conditions, uh, and the indoor conditions. So what are the assumed conditions of use 
in the different types of spaces in your building. And that's uh, the one. And then we left outside of this uh, list of key standards, the ones which uh, uh, provide the input data from the products and building elements. Uh, but on the right side, you see two other standards. They uh, are for the conversion of the uh, overall energy into the different types of indicators and the um, benchmarks for uh, comparing with requirements for the ratings and uh, the other one uh, on the um, partial indicators on the building fabric and the energy needs and thermal comfort, I should add. Um, and then finally, you need a, a framework for all this, common definitions, common symbols, uh, and so on, and that's covered again in the overarching standard. So on top you see the overarching, oh, do it again. <laughs> Hard learning. So, uh, the uh, you see the overarching standard again. So that the overarching standard is, so to say, the alpha and the omega of the set of standards. And it's also the first and the most important standard of the 52,000 family of standards, which is the name given to the energy performance standards when they have are moved uh, uh, from SEN level or upgraded from SEN level to SEN and ISO level. So... Um, yeah, okay, uh, does this mean that you have a one-size-fits-all set? No, you already understood from Pau that uh, there are, uh, the standards are flexible. You need so that they are unambiguous, but at the same time flexible. So there are specific options uh, allowed in the standards to tailor the um, procedures or the input data to the national and regional situation. And that has to do with either climate, culture, building or traditional building typology and policy and legal frameworks. So uh, there are quite some types of, um, of these kind of uh, choices in the various standards. And uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to draw your attention to the USERT workshop tomorrow morning at uh, 11 o'clock, uh, which goes more into the details of the, um, uh, of the application of the EPB standards and in particular on the different choices uh, you can make at the national level and the recommendations on these choices, tools which are developed for to help you on that and also on uh, uh, recommendations regarding indicators and the information on, e uh, on the energy performance certificates. So that's tomorrow morning at uh, 11 o'clock. And uh, that brings me to a request from Andre to those persons, so that's a practical <laughs> question. Those of you here in the room who have not yet registered on the participant list, could you please raise your hand so that uh, your name can be added to the participant list. I see no hands raised, so apparently you all signed the list. The Laurent Socal here has not put his name on the list, so I uh, hope he can be added to it. Okay, then I continue with uh, my presentation. Uh, so what's the role of the EPB Center? So the EPB Center was initiated in 2017 after the publication of the, the bulk of the EPB standards in SEN and ISO. I already mentioned it in uh, my uh, introduction uh, during the welcoming to this workshop to ensure that the expertise would not uh, get lost and kept alive and uh, to support the uptake of the EPB standards by providing information, technical assistance, and capacity building services to the involved uh, stakeholders. And also to be a communication platform to offer these uh, services. And of course, it's uh, evident that the close contacts are maintained with SEN and ISO, uh, where these uh, standards are maintained and further developed. Uh, so uh, you can find it also at the EPB Center website, uh, the, the names of the experts. So the experts uh, are the persons who have been involved in the uh, development of the set of standards are intended to, to, uh, to 
progress on that and uh, uh, and the staff and also new uh, experts uh, we call them emergency next generation experts who so that's to keep uh, everything uh, alive and to progress uh, with um, evidently a, a global network of contacts with other experts and stakeholders that have been uh, developed in the over the years uh, and also as making it advantage of the uh, links with SEN and ISO where you also have hundreds of experts in the, in the various countries uh, at global level. Uh, so the EPB Center has a website which contains a large amount of um, publicly available information on the set of EPB standards. You have dozens of frequently asked questions uh, which are organized and so that you easily can can find your way there. Uh, uh, recordings from 10 webinars we, we have held uh, during the last two COVID uh, years. Uh, 10 short videos with uh, specific information on uh, special topics. And uh, a number of tools uh, on the individual standards, so spreadsheets on the individual standards to validate and demonstrate them. And 16 of them have been recently updated um, and 14 detailed case studies. All this information can be publicly downloaded from, from the website and it's still growing. And of course, we also have, um, we also wel you welcome you or invite you to, uh, to di have direct uh, contact with us if you have questions or suggestions. Um, but apart from the website, we uh, are active at social media, at events, uh, uh, partnership in international uh, research and demonstration project or policy related projects. Uh, a platform for trainings and updates. So this morning you have, uh, some of you have uh, participated in the Sensi workshop where you saw that uh, these kind of trainings are offered and uh, the EPB Center is uh, uh, offering uh, the plat itself as platform for these kind of uh, trainings and consultancy services, so he'll, quite simple, uh, you can ask the as expert by just uh, sending an email to, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the website and it will direct it to the expert or you can contact the experts uh, directly. And to provide targeted guidance and consultancy for a variety of stakeholders. And uh, yeah, these are just some snapshots from the website, but you really you should uh, look at the web in the website yourself and, uh, and um, uh, go through the different uh, pages and see if you can find the information. And again, if you have questions, just, just contact us. Um, and then finally, uh, to co conclude my presentation, uh, we um, came up with the idea of consultancy packages uh, just as a, a suggestion for, for the kind of consultancy uh, services we could offer. So we have two of those. Uh, um, uh, so the one is uh, to, to give guidance on um, how to fill in the national choices for the various EPB standards bec because uh, <coughs> these, these have an you need to understand what's the background of the choice, what's the impact of the choice, what's the links between the different choices in the, di in the different standards. Uh, so that could be uh, an interest of uh, at national level or regional level or, or, or also from specific uh, stakeholders. And the second one is more going into the technology. So if you have specific if you have interests in, uh, in certain technologies, so some parts of the EPB set of standards, then uh, uh, the EPB center con could give uh, uh, general information and then targeted information on the specific technology and we could have a dialogue on uh, the merits and what could be imp improved there. And again, we could uh, uh, use our links with SEN and ISO to see what can be uh, done in, on that uh, level. Um, so that concludes my uh, presentation on the EPB Center, and uh, that brings us now uh, a quarter of an hour later than uh, planned, but we still have a quarter of an hour for the open discussions on the EPB standards and the way ahead.
So, yeah. If uh, somebody wants to ask a question, I kindly ask you to come here directly so that I'm not the only one exercising. You can also do some exercise. Thank you. So let me try to give the, <laughs> the kick off. Uh, I have, in fact, a question for, uh, for you. Of course, you presented a lot, but in fact, the zero emission building concept uh, definition was a bit missing, and also with regard to the standardization. But I think there's now already such a strong fundament on how the energy performance for buildings in its operational phase is calculated. Uh, I think that towards uh, the emission of a building, that's already a good fundament. But I see in Annex 3, at least in the draft, although the French presidency gave some different interpreta interpretations, but let's not talk about that probably. But anyhow, the emission um, of, of a building, um, that has to be recalculated according to uh, the life cycle assessment, the global warming potential of the life cycle. Um, but to my understanding, the, the mandate for 80 and the standard developed are already very strong fundament in combination pro probably with the primary energy factors in order to have some clear outspoken statements already on the, uh, on the carbon emission. Of course, there has to be a life cycle influence that would have to be added. I think most of that work has been done already. But how is your consideration on that? So if I understood correctly, it's mainly regarding the uh, global warming potential of the uh, building and the, uh, the life cycle. So um, on the, because um, uh, I have to be careful because that's not one of my articles. So uh, I need to, to remember a little bit, um, but the, um, there are two sides of it. The uh, the operational side, that's of course calculated according to the uh, to the calculation methodology. That's that's the basis of it. Um, that's uh, that's not um, not under discussion. The um, the other aspect is the calculation of the embedded energy in and the embedded emissions in the uh, in the building, and that's proposed to be done following the levels framework, um, which is. I want to say currently a devel under development, but I think it's pretty much finished um, by DG Environment. So the um, the methodology itself is pretty much finished. Um, what is missing or what it still need to be developed is all the support mechanism to do that, to, to put it in practice. And that goes from uh, calculation tools, so providing the, uh, the methodology, so then companies can take it and, and make it a, fr a nice front end and easy to calculate. Perhaps on one of the most critical elements is all the databases and libraries that go associated with it because um, any engineers or architects that want to calculate that, they need very good data in terms of how much CO2 is there in a cubic meter of concrete of this type or how much CO2 is there in um, a standard I-beam or whatever you put in a building. Um, quite relevant for heat pumps and chillers, global warming potential of uh, refrigerants, etc. So they are now developing all these libraries and, and making sure that this information is available. And then there is also the last part, which is training for the professionals. So they are also developing all the advice, all the training. And the idea is to have all of these finished by, uh, by the date of uh, when the calculation will need to take. The first calculations, which I think is uh, 2027, I think it's the earlier adoption for buildings over 2,000 square meters. Um, that uh, by then they need they need to be all these rules need to be in place already. Sorry, all these rules, all these support tools. Yeah. Why not? I want to start it. <laughs> um, that's that's in fact a question for. Um, um, for an American uh, 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 friend over here, um, uh, with regard to ASHRAE, you clearly mentioned, okay, we in, in fact, ASHRAE, the A is, is getting more global. In that sense, I've seen there's a lot of standard development, especially the 90.1, uh, 
Um, but we also have seen a lot of standard development now in, in Europe, where a big part has been brought to ISO. And I think the ISO is, is really a, cent is a kind of global center in order to bring these uh, standards together and see how can we can some common agreement on that. Does that also mean that uh, like ASHRAE is also uh, open up to discuss, uh, for example, on this 19.1 uh, standard from ASHRAE also at the, the, the relevant uh, ISO uh, platforms like TC205 and 163 and so on. Thank uh, you. Th thank you for the question. Uh, there are a lot of ASHRAE members who are involved in the ISO process, more now than we're in the past, because uh, we used to think that we could do things throughout the world with, by ourselves, and we have learned that in order to have an impact, we need to work with partners. So I, I'm not making any particular commitments here, but we're going to continue to work together. We had great meetings with the REVA leadership in January and today, and we also said, when's the next time we're going to get together and what work do we want to accomplish in the meantime? So we're very open to continuing to collaborate and work together. May, may, may I add that uh, I, I think the, the chances are in improving uh, for collaboration since uh, also in Ashray you're moving towards a performance-based mm -hmm. methodology with your yes. Appendix C. Yes. So that... Um, that then, then uh, you get more coherence in, uh, in, in the basic approach. And that, that's about 12 years old, Appendix G already. Yeah, and so we're, and it's, but it's not we're the mainstream. Forward. Right. It's not the mainstream yet, <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Garcia uh, uh, Audi. Uh, my name is Ram Valk. I'm uh, 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 chair of the Dutch Standard Committee on uh, energy performance on buildings. Um, I'm wondering why we still refer to cost optimization when we refer to net zero uh, uh, buildings. Shouldn't we just um, give the, the politics the, uh, the assessment to, 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 to set that as the standard and uh, set aside the uh, cost optimization? Funny enough, it's actually the member states that like it. Um, no, they, they, they really do, um, because they, it gives them a tool to demonstrate to their parliaments and to their um, political um, initiatives to say, this is the, the, the cost optimal level. This is as good as it gets over the lifetime of the building. And, and that really gives them the, um, it, it's a good base to start. So. It's actually the member states that really like it. Yeah. No, that's the. Uh, no, that's that's the reason why the um, in the uh, proposal for the EPBD in 2021, the one that the Commission made, um, we moved away from the um, from the cost optimal because it, I think it's a good methodology, but indeed is iterative and it may not be fast enough. Um, so the zero emission building definition has two steps. It has the, uh, the very high energy performance and then it has the coverage by renewables. So the very high energy performance, um, on the one hand side, we could go as, fast, as far as we, as we wanted. We, we could go all the way, which may not be the best way of doing it. Um, so the, the part of the high energy efficiency definition it's there uh, for two reasons. To avoid um, cardboard boxes with PV panels. Uh, so in energy buildings that are not energy efficiency at all and they are just use renewables to compensate. And then to make sure that the building stock as a whole, as much as possible, has a very good energy performance. If then, um, th then there is a second part of the definition which is that you need to cover as much as, well, you need to cover 100% with renewables. And there's where the balancing act starts. If you go very high on the energy performance level, sorry, if you really go ambitious in the terms of energy performance, you won't need as much renewables to compensate. So there's where the, um, the cost optimal calculation for each individual building take place. So why we provided the benchmarks or why the cost optimal is a possibility to set these levels, is that's the moment where, okay, you do this, that's good enough in terms of, of high energy efficiency. 
you go beyond that, then you need to start considering what are the trade-offs for, for your building. So it's, it's basically there to say, you can do this, no worse than this, because then you start damaging the building stock, but then you need to take into account all the different elements. I am Ole Tyson from Denmark, from Sweco. And uh, I have a question. Now we saw this huge system of standards that can set criteria up for all kinds of installations and systems. But how do you actually assure that it also happens in the real world, what you set up of criteria? And this is not a question for ASHRAE, because you have your system of commissioning standards and, and guidelines. <coughs> but we don't have that in Europe. So what do we do here? Um, yeah, well, so the, 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 this, this is um, about um, different things. So it's, a, it's about the gap between uh, the calculated and the, um, and the measured energy performance. Um, so th that is um, one of the aspects which uh, uh, gets growing attention and uh, for the right reasons because uh, um, what, what you try to do in your calculations is to uh, to take uh, the uh, to to use a, a, a calculation procedures and based on and uh, input data that are uh, uh, representing the actual situation as best as possible, but of course assuming a, a proper product and a proper control of the product, product, proper installation of the product, and a proper use of the product, product of products and components. And uh, that's not always the case, as you also uh, seem to imply. Um, so, but there are, so there are different, so there are different uh, steps to be taken to, to, uh, to get uh, this improved. So if you um, think about uh, decreasing the, step, the, the gap between uh, calculated and measured energy performance uh, is, is actually still a black box then. Uh, so you need uh, to analyze the reasons for the, the difference. And actually it's where the calculations are very powerful because with the, with the calculations you have a breakdown of the energy into the different components and you can use smart <coughs> techniques to, and sometimes you don't need smart techniques, it's quite obvious from, uh, from, um, from the difference uh, by, for instance, using an energy signature, uh, which gives you the, uh, the, uh, uh, the dependency of the energy used from the, from, from the outdoor temperature. Uh, uh, so that's a very easy technique, uh, but you can also use more smart techniques to, to, find, uh, to, get to find the suspicious uh, causes for the discrepancy. So that's, that's one way. And the other way is, of course, to make sure that, uh, that uh, the, the products are uh, as much as possible fail-proof uh, in their design and also in the installation. And, and then the, uh, this morning we had this workshop on the training aspects, and I don't think we should repeat that uh, <laughs> here in this workshop. But uh, perhaps Laurent Socal, who was one of the key persons there, could say some words about that aspect. Yeah, it's a, just to mention one thing. Uh, of course, there is this issue because in the calculation, everything works correctly. And in the real world, this is not this is far from guaranteed. More or less, it's the, the opposite. There is some effort. For example, uh, in uh, the EN 14336, which is installation and commissioning of heating and domestic hot water systems. So this kind of standard is being prepared, and uh, it has been designed to be more or less supporting the ASHRAE 202 process, which is quite global, but it can be used as a supporting tool because it is really an important uh, fact. Francis Allard from France. Uh, I am a more physicist than a industrial, but you, you are looking for something which doesn't exist. If you are using a standard method 
for evaluating the energy consumption of a building. You have many assumptions we, we, which are not the real world. So you cannot pretend by a measurement to check your evaluation. Maybe with, with a, a modeling, a, a detailed modeling of the building, you can go closer and closer to the real behavior. But if you want the real behavior of a building, you have to take into account the local, for instance, uh, uh, urban climate around the building. You, you have to, to take into account a lot of things which are not in, in the standard method. So, the, the, in my opinion, the standard method, they are not there in order to get an absolute evaluation of the energy consumption. But it's only to compare, in fact, different kind of buildings with the same assumptions. We take, we can agree on, uh, and that's the, the work you are doing in the standardization <coughs> bodies. You agree on a, a set of assumptions, and then we ensure that every building will be compared with the same hypothesis, with the same assumption. But these assumptions are not the real world. So, in my opinion, we have, very, we have to be very careful when we, we pretend to compare a real energy consumption with a prediction by a standard method. It's a nonsense, in my opinion. It, it could be close, yeah. it could be not, but you don't know why. <laughs> Historically, uh, analysis programs have been done to uh, compare the differences. But what's changed, I'll say, in the last five to seven years is what's called a digital twin, where you make a digital version of the building with the modeling software, you take the actual data, and you tune that digital twin to monitor and follow what the actual building consumption is. What that does is over the life of the building, when the energy usage starts to um, step away from what the simulation says, it's a lot easier to find the reasons and to, to mitigate the issues in that particular building. And we've seen significant successes with that. Just, sorry. It's a different point. Uh, I have been doing simulation all my life. <laughs> and so uh, it's for sure that with simulation, a detailed simulation today, we can be very close to the reality. But then the hypothesis, they are not the same that the, the hypothesis we are using for standardization. Because we are, for instance, we are predicting the, the local climate around the building and things like that. And then you can compare, really. But so, in my opinion, th there is a misunderstanding very often what is the role of the standardization and the evaluation, the final evaluation, if you want. So it's two things different. Uh, this is something that, sorry, I lost you. Uh, this is something that um, it always, yeah, it, I, don't know, I don't know if I should say baffles or surprises me, but I, I like making the comparison. When we buy a car, uh, cars run a standard test. Um, and it comes out with a figure of so many liters per 100 kilometers or so many uh, miles per gallon, sorry. Um, so, uh, and we all accept that that's a standard test and it's just there to compare cars. Um, and that's it. Like, uh, and I will drive the car completely different to somebody else right next to me and uh, or I will drive it in the city, the other person will drive it mainly for road and the results in our daily consumption will be completely different. That's, that's why for the asset comparison, we very much need standard criteria. Uh, and we, we can't compare that to the actual usage of a, of a building. When I, um, what I used to do though when I was doing um, modeling in the private sector is I would always run two models. One was the standard model for standard conditions, which was the one that I was using for calculating and compliance with minimum energy performance requirement and producing the EPC. That was one model. The other model is the one where I was actually calibrating it a little bit much, well, a little bit much better according to, to the usage of the building. 
speaking with the owner, how are you going to use the building? What are you going to do with it? How do you want to, uh, to operate it? And then we would provide a completely separate model and say, look, this is what the legislation says. This is what you will put in your, uh, in your requirements. This is more or less what your building is going to do. There are two different things. And if we explain that, the building owner was happy. Yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I suggest just a few, uh, just a few comments for, from you, if you like that, and then uh, see if there are other questions because we are running out of time, so we have to okay. close uh, the workshop. Yeah, perhaps one, one relevant uh, question because I fully agree. It's energy performance of buildings and not energy performance of behavior. That's, that's another <laughs> translation. <Yes. laughs> um, so, and I think it's uh, the question I would like to make that's more to link with the uh, with other directives there are and with other. Uh, policy measures like taxonomy is, I think, a very powerful. But in taxonomy, uh, the banking world, the investors' world, is a completely different world than the world of building engineers. Uh, they don't like to know whether it is 15.4 uh, kilowatt per square meter or whatever. No, they, they have a, a different uh, vo vocabulary. So in, the, in that sense, but it is very powerful if the elements we have, like in the standardization, that at least we have the comparability, if this is reused within uh, taxonomy, in order to make also to, to reward it, to, to utilize then also the European policies, European standards, in order then to also reward the financial worlds uh, if they are cer going certain directions. And of course, they are always thinking in, in risk margins. So, and when, then when the products or when the building is behaving slightly different, that's not an issue for a financial investor. Then perhaps the tolerance is like this. But if in future we see it's getting more and more narrow, this tolerance, and the emission is going down, mm -hmm. they are very happy because they will see value within their mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. and they don't have to depreciate on it. So if we can make these links from EPBD to taxonomy, of course it's a different field, but uh, I think many people would welcome that. It's Thank on you. the works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I uh, yeah. Very shortly. I had two remarks, and the first Pau answered the same thing I would have answered. So representativity, easier set for a rating representative. And the second, I will answer to you tomorrow in the U3 meeting. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, I, I, is there another urgent question from someone else uh, <laughs> in the room? And if not, then I'd like to thank uh, you all for your uh, presence and the speakers in particular for their presentations. And uh, hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.